Okay, good. So today we're going to uh, talk about an update about the Centennial Olympics, the talk that I gave about two years ago. And these are things that uh, I've changed in my training program, things that have changed in my, my approach to nutrition, or what I call a nutritional biochemistry. Some of the things that I'll also I'll be talking about today is the difference between health span and lifespan. Heart disease is the number one threat to your lifespan and what we can do about it. Why exercise is the most potent measure for increasing longevity and health. How to build your exercise program as we age. Why you should be building your diet around protein. The question that I want you to ask yourself at the end of this is, what is my future trajectory and what am I going to do about it? There comes a time where we need to stop just pulling people out of the water, we need to go upstream to find out why they're falling in. This is a quote from Bishop Tutu. We're often asked how old we are. I was born in this date, and this is our chronological age. Our biological age is how old we feel. What is your cardiopulmonary fitness status? Your muscle mass? Do you have full, full range of motion in your joints? Are you in pain? What is the condition of your liver and your kidney? Your microbiome? What is the state of your hormones? Do you still get horny? Biological age is under our control, and it takes work. It takes a well thought out plan. But all of this is influenced by our lifestyle. Today I will talk to you about lifestyle changes that will influence your biological age. There's been several books this last year that came out about longevity. And again, I'm no longevity expert, but I know, I know about the diseases that are likely to kill us. And I know the things that we can avoid to promote early death. The meaning of longevity needs to be known mean more than notching up more birthdays as we slowly wither away. This is what happened to the mythological Greek Dionys, who asked for eternal life, and to his joy, the, the gods granted his wish. But because he forgot to ask for eternal youth as well, his body continued to uh, decay. Oops. <laughs> like most of my colleagues in medicine, we are trained to prevent fast death. We have become very adept at saving lives, restoring function, and reviving patients who are near death. Really good at pulling people out of the water, but not so good at preventing them from falling in in the first place. What determines lifespan is predominantly four diseases. Atherosclerotic heart disease. So when I talk, uh, they use the term atherosclerotic heart disease, I'm talking about strokes and heart attacks. Cancer neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, and metabolic diseases. If you're over the age of 65, the fourth leading cause of death is a fall. If you're over 65 and you fall and you break your hip, your mortality, according to several studies, shows it's real, uh, roughly 50%. Metabolic diseases such as diabetes does not generally cause death, but is a major risk factor for the top four causes of death. If you're a non-smoker, these four diseases account for 80% of all deaths. What defines health span? The standard definition for health span is the period of life we are free from disease and disability. I believe health span has three components. Your cognitive health, your ability to solve complex problems, your short and long-term memory, and our executive function your physical health, your muscle mass and strength, your bone density, your stamina, your stability and your balance, your ability to move without pain, your emotional health. But like the first two, this can, this can afflict us at any age. Research shows that happiness reaches its nadir in, our, in the 40s. We may not recognize we have a problem until we reach our breaking point. How we deal with our emotional health greatly affects not only our, our cognitive health, but our physical health as well. The great Jerry Rebin was an endocrinologist out at Stanford, and in the 60s, he noted excess weight often traveled in company with certain other markers of poor health. He noted that the majority of heart attack victims often had high 
blood glucose, high triglycerides, low HDL, high blood pressure, and trumpal obesity. Today, we call this metabolic syndrome. If you meet three of these criteria, you have metabolic syndrome. According to a 2020 JAMA article, about 90% of Americans over the age of 40 meet at least two of these criteria. We hear the term insulin resistance quite a bit. Insulin resistance is the main driver of metabolic syndrome. Insulin resistance is a term that's getting thrown out a lot lately, but what does it mean? It means a cell, initially the muscle cell, has stopped listening to insulin. Imagine a balloon being blown up with air. Sugar is the air within the balloon. Imagine the balloon is now full of air. If you have, to, you have to blow harder and harder and harder. Insulin is the driving force behind getting air into that balloon. The pancreas is the organ of the body that regulates blood sugar by secreting insulin. The pancreas is now producing large amounts of insulin to force sugar into the cell to remove sugar from the bloodstream. For the, for the time being, this works, but eventually blood glucose levels increase as well as the amount of insulin that you're producing. This is the point where we see trouble in the blood tests. This individual has high amounts of insulin and high amounts of glucose at the same time while the pancreas is starting to putter out. The treatment needs to be that we need to deflate that balloon somehow, either by diet or by exercise. We do have drugs such as metformin that do the same thing. I realize I spend a lot of time talking about insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is the driver of metabolic disease. Again, metabolic syndrome is a major risk factor for the leading causes of death. Insulin resistance and decreased sensitivity to protein are the main drivers of age-related muscle loss. To avoid these things as we age, we must avoid insulin resistance and optimize protein. And we'll talk more about protein in a, in a while. Lifestyle changes are much more effective than pharmaceutical agents in treating insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. In fact, some of these agents, like sulfurureas, can actually make the problem worse. 18.6 million Americans died from heart attacks in, in 2019. That's pre-COVID data. Second was cancer at 10 million. Nothing even comes in the same zip code as as a driver of disease than atherosclerosis. Generally, four things are out of whack for the development of atherosclerotic heart disease. Your metabolism, your cholesterol, inflammation, and endothelial health. I lump hypertension into two of those, inflammation and endothelial health. Blood work can help us determine your risk for developing heart disease. One thing that should be looked at at least once in your lifetime is a blood test called LP little a. LP little a is a. LP little a is a genetic variant that 20 or 10 to 20 percent of the U.S. population carry. This variant can increase your risk of developing atherosclerotic heart disease by 75 percent. Confronting and preventing heart disease. I still remember sitting in class and the professor asking us, what is the most common presentation of someone having a heart attack? And we all raised our hands and shouted out chest pain. No, 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 he said. We thought, well, maybe left arm pain. No, 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 maybe shortness of breath, no. And then there was a brief pause and he looked at us <coughs> and he said, sudden death, you dummies. <laughs> He went on to explain that the only doctors that truly understand cardiovascular disease are pathologists. While we have made many improvements to drastically reduce mortality thanks to advancements in basic cardiac life support, door to balloon times, life saving interventions such as ECMO, heart attacks are still fatal at least one third of the time. Heart attacks kill roughly 2,000 people every day, according to the CDC in the United States. Women are up to 10 times more likely to die from a heart attack 
and from breast cancer. Half of all major adverse cardiovascular events in men and one third in women occur before the age of 65. In men, one quarter of all events occur before the age of 54. Atherosclerosis needs to be looked at as a lifelong disease. Age is the predominant risk factor. How do we reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease? We don't smoke, maintain a healthy blood pressure, get plenty of exercise, optimize your sleep, optimize your emotional health, choose good parents, that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> maintain a healthy cholesterol level, avoid diabetes and insulin resistance, and maintain a good weight. Both blood pressure and smoking acts as irritants to the innermost lining of the arterial wall, known as the endothelium. Smoking is a chemical irritant, while blood pressure is more of a mechanical irritant. Study after study show that the higher the blood pressure, the higher the <laughs> risk of heart attacks, strokes, and kidney failure. The majority of people with high blood pressure are without symptoms. High blood pressure is likely the most prevalent, undertreated, and underdiagnosed uh, diagnosis that we have in the United States. How to work with your pri uh, primary care doctor to manage your blood pressure? What if I told you that the blood pressure you had performed in your doctor's office was most likely inaccurate? Your blood pressure needs to be taken with both feet planted on your floor, so no legs are crossed. You need to be uh, sitting down. Your leg needs to be on an object. The cuff needs to be about an inch above your elbow crease so that it's at the level of your heart. It needs, before you had, uh, it needs to be done before you had coffee in the morning or before you had your first cigarette. That's your blood pressure. I often ask my patients once a year to take their blood pressure uh, twice a week, once in the morning, once around supper time, and record it, and either bring it back to me or the primary care doctor. And that's how we should manage blood pressure, and that's how we should adjust their medications accordingly. <laughs> Cholesterol is essential for life. It is neither good nor bad. It makes up all our cell membranes. It's a building block for hormones such as testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, and cortisol. When I get somebody's lab results, my eyes dart to their ApoB, their LDLC, and their LP little a to determine the, the patient's risk for developing heart disease. Once you establish the central importance of, of, of LDLC and ApoB, the next question becomes, by how much does one need to lower it to achieve meaningful risk reduction? Various treatment guidelines specify target ranges for LDLC, typically less than 100 milligrams per deciliter for a normal risk individual, or 70 milligrams per deciliter for those at high risk, and less than 50 milligrams per deciliter for diabetics with either heart disease or strokes. Most people can eat dietary cholesterol. What people need to realize is that the cholesterol that we find in food and the cholesterol we find in the blood, bloodstream are two different entities. The cholesterol that's in food is a much larger molecule. It's hysterified. And luckily, at our, at our gut, we have these bouncers called the neiman pixie axis. The neiman pixie axis doesn't let these big, large molecules of cholesterol pass. So it's, it's safe to eat foods such as uh, eggs and shrimp that are high in cholesterol. What people get confused is that they confuse saturated fat with cholesterol. So eggs are high in cholesterol, but low in saturated fat. Or steak, on the other hand, is is uh, high in cholesterol and saturated fat. Some people, uh, like myself, I'm very sensitive to eating saturated fat. That raises my cholesterol. 
And the only way that you're going to know whether you're sensor, sensitive to saturated fat is through a blood test. So as, as far as picking out the alternative diet, I mean, this is something that you need to work with your primary care doctor about. <coughs> Triglycerides represent, represent fats in the blood that are actually the easiest to manipulate by diet. Lowering the amount of dietary carbohydrates, especially those that we drink, will drastically reduce some of these triglycerides. How to lower your cholesterol? Diet and exercise can help a bit. We have general guidelines for, for specific groups of people. If you have diabetes, a prior stroke, heart attack, coronary artery disease, a stent, or bypass surgery, cholesterol-lowering medications are a standard of care. If you have risk factors for atherosclerotic heart disease and are hesitant to take medications to lower your cholesterol, we can offer you a CT calcium score or a CTA of, of your coronaries to detect whether you have plaquing or calcium deposits in your arteries of your heart. A calcium score is scored in what we call a gastin units, where a zero would represent no disease, one to 99 is mild disease, 100 to 400 is moderate disease, and greater than 400 is severe disease. We must realize the process of atherosclerosis is a lifelong disease. Autopsies of young men killed during the Vietnam War showed fatty deposits in these 19 to 21 year old soldiers. As a Cleveland Clinic cardiologist said to me once, we will all die with cardiovascular disease, but some of us will die because of it. So the questions that you need to ask yourself is, how old do you want to be before atherosclerosis goes from being subclinical to, a clini to clinically relevant? What is your family history of cardiovascular disease? Do you smoke or have high blood pressure? What is your LP little a level? How metabolically fit are you? And what is your current burden of disease? And then lastly, what is your appetite for pharmacological intervention of your cholesterol? So now I talked about the number one killer of disease. Why don't we talk about things that we can do about it? The data is clear. Exercise not only delays the uh, death, but also prevents cognitive and physical decline better than any drug or intervention we have. It is the single most potent tool we have in our health span enhancing toolkit. The problem being most healthcare professionals know little, know little about exercise, not alone how to prescribe it. Like nutrition, we all have our own certain biases. No one is surprised to hear that having high cardiorespiratory fitness and the maintenance of muscle is good for us but my patients are always amazed by the magnitude of the benefit. We measure cardiopulmonary fitness by a measurement of what we call VO2 max. It is the maximum amount of oxygen your body can utilize during intense exercise. Why this is relevant? In 2018, a study published in JAMA followed 120,000 people and found that the people that had the highest VO2 max was associated with a seven-fold risk reduction in all-cause mortality. The group that was at its lowest average VO2 max was at double the risk of all-cause mortality compared to the fit group. The good news is just by going from below average to slightly above average, reduces your all-cause mortality by 5x. Our human bodies are amazing. A guy my size, sitting around, would require about 300 milliliters of oxygen per minute to generate enough energy to power my body to stay alive. But let's say I go out for a jog. My energy demands increase. 
my breathing rate increases along with my heart rate in order to deliver more oxygen to my mus working muscles. At this level of work, I will require about three liters of oxygen per minute, a tenfold increase from where I was sitting. Now I hit a steep hill. My body oxygen demands even more. Now I require about five liters of, of oxygen per minute. The fitter I am, the faster I'm able to run up that hill. Eventually, I'll reach a point where I cannot produce any more energy using this oxygen-dependent pathway and will use a less efficient pathway. Once I hit this, is when I, this represents my VO2 max, or the max amount of oxygen I can consume. Why I became much more muscle-centric in my thinking compared to two years ago. By maintaining muscle mass, we have a good shot of avoiding obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. The average American loses about 1% of muscle mass per year of life after the age of 35. For every 1% of muscle mass loss equates to a 2% loss of strength and a 4% loss of power. Losing muscle means loss of bone density, increases your risk of fractures. Loss of muscle mass means loss of mobility. When we also lose muscle, we also lose storage capacity for glucose. When we consume food, our body produces sugar because it knows that the, the brain likes sugar. If you're not moving around, if you're not exercising, that sugar should, 80 to 90% of that sugar should be uh, deposited in your muscle. And if you're losing muscle, now you're losing storage uh, for that sugar to go. So that sugar ends up going back to your liver and that's where fat is formed for uh, disposition for a later date. The, the strong association between cardiorespiratory fitness and longevity has long been known. It's, it surprised me that muscle is as equally important. A recent 10-year study of 4,500 subjects aged 50 and older found those of low muscle mass were at a 40 to 50% increased risk of mortality. Further analysis revealed that it's not just mere muscle mass that matters, but strength of the muscle. Muscle needs to be able to generate force. Subjects with low muscle mass and strength in metabolic syndrome had a threefold greater risk of all cause mortality. Why I prescribe exercise to just about all of my patients? It was found that exercise-based interventions performed as well or better than multiple classes of pharmaceutical drugs at reducing mortality from coronary disease, diabetes, and strokes. In patients with heart failure due to reduced heart function, pharmaceuticals were superior to exercise. And that was the only group. Building a nest egg of muscle. Age-related muscle mass loss starts insidiously in our 30s and picks up pace in our 50s. It is called sarcopenia. It's from a Greek word meaning poverty of the flesh. We should think of strength training as a form of retirement savings, just as you want to retire with enough money saved up to sustain you for the rest of your life. You want to reach an older age with enough of a reserve of muscle to protect you from injury and allow you to continue to pursue the activities you enjoy. The larger the reserve of you build early on, the better you will be down the road. I think most people would do much better if they thought of themselves as being under muscle versus overweight. The majority of us could drastically change the arc of our lives by adding five to six pounds of muscle this year. As healthcare professionals, we spend way too much time looking at someone's BMI or their weight and not looking underneath their hood. Body composition is much more important than, than weight. A DEXA scan is a tool that we have at Asheville County Medical Center that can look at bone density as well as body composition. How fat is distributed is more important, is importantly real, uh, realizing that abdominal fat is much more 
dangerous than the fat that we have on our butt and our thighs. Strong bones and muscles represent robust health. Excess weight is the second leading cause of cancer, according to the American Cancer Society. It is impossible to provide superior support performance unless you do something different than the majority. Sir John Templeton. How to best train to become a centenarian. Most people think the primary benefit of exercise is to burn calories, and it does. But you should also be interested in the finer distinction, not in calories burned, but the type of fuel utilized during exercise. How we utilize different fuels, glucose and fatty acids, is critical not only to our fitness, but to our metabolism and overall health. Aerobic exercise, specifically zone two, improves our ability to utilize fat as fuel. The key is our mitochondria. Mitochondria are the portion of our cells that produce energy. As we get older, we have less mitochondria and the, the mitochondria also become less efficient. But with zone two training, they can become more efficient and increase in number. Mitochondria can burn glucose as well as fat, but in zone two training, they become much more efficient at, at burning fat. The goal in our life is to become metabolically flexible. We have unlimited fat stores, but when you are a primary sugar burner, you're, uh, when you primarily burn sugar, you are limited in your functional capacity, which leads to early fatigue and shortness of breath. Healthy mitochondria are essential for our brain health and to control bad actors such as oxidative store stress and inflammation. To be honest, it took me some time and some convincing about zone two training. I was one of those guys that in the gym that loved that high intensity stuff. That is until I started following the work of Indigo San, Indigo San Milan, a brilliant exercise scientist, a professor at the University of Colorado uh, School of Medicine. He works with many professional athletes and winners of the last several Tour de France. As, fun, as fundamental as zone two training is for professional cyclists, San Milan believes it is even more important for the rest of us. First, it builds a base of endurance for everything that we do in our lives. Second, it plays a critical role in preventing chronic diseases by improving the health and efficiency of your mitochondria. Zone two training has become my first element of my Centennial uh, training program. Zone two training can be performed on any piece of exercise equipment. If you know your max heart rate, zone two will be 70 to 85% of that. Max heart rate can be estimated as 220 minus your age. Because I find heart rate launches inaccurate, I find the top test as being equally important in monitoring zone two training. If you can comfortably carry, hold the conversation while you're exercising, you're not working hard enough. But the other extreme is if I cannot hold on the conversation while I'm exercising, I'm, I'm above my zone two training. So zone two training would be somewhere in between. So like if I was talking to somebody, I still could carry on a conversation, but, but I would be, be gasping. Like if I was on the phone, you would definitely know that I would be exercising. Duration. Sam Milan finds that those that get the best results are getting at least four days uh, per week at 45 to 50 minutes duration. And if you're just getting started, just start off by five to 10 minutes and then try to add 10% each week. I'm really starting to enjoy zone two training. I find this time to get caught up in my podcasts and my audio books. You need to think of your aerobic fitness as a pyramid where zone two is the base and zone five is the peak. Zone two represents a steady state cruising along at a steady rate. Zone five is the opposite spectrum, a hard minutes long pace. 
In zone five, we're using a combination of aerobic and anaerobic pathways to produce energy. We're at their maximum rate of oxygen consumption at zone five. I recommend people don't attempt zone five until they develop a zone two base of at least five to six months. So why is this training so important? Your VO2 max is directly correlated to your longevity. It is striking how steeply VO2 max declines with age and how that decline corresponds to your functional capacity. Let me give you an example. The average 45 year old can briskly climb a flight of stairs with VO2 max of around 32. But at 75, such a feat demands that person be at the upper 5% of that age group of VO2 max. Activities that would be easy when we are in our 40s become increasingly difficult, if not impossible as we age. This explains why so many people are miserable in the last decade of life. This is why I am encouraging you now to train as high VO2 max as possible, so that when you maintain a high level of physical function as we age. The good news is you don't have to spend too much time in the pain cave. Remember, we're training for life, so one to two sessions per week will boost your VO2 max, and this also can be performed on a treadmill, a bike, a stair machine, a rower, or a pool. One of my favorite routines is what I call 4x4 training. So I do this on a salt bike or a uh, stair machine. So four minutes of intense exercise, followed by four minutes rest, repeated four times. And I do that once a week. Uh, since I started doing this, uh, I increased my VO2 max from two years ago about 15%. I find this training, because it is intense, to find a, a, a partner. I, I credit physical therapy and a movement specialist on helping me identify my weaknesses and relearning how to move. I still remember squatting for the physical therapist and him yelling out, ooh. <laughs> and he, he, him explaining, he goes, this is the reason why my back ached. When I squatted, my hips were on level, my right foot flared out, and this threw my whole body out of balance. Believe it or not, the therapist first started out on me learning how to do something called diaphragmatic breathing. I'm not going to go into all the details about the training uh, due to time, but the point is, if you want to get better, you need to identify your weaknesses before they lead to injury. We are lucky here in Ashtabula that we have such a great team of physical therapists. Some components of of my resistance training uh, sessions. First is stability. I, I spend about 10 to 15 minutes per session working on stability work. Uh, work. Next is grip strength, pushing, pulling exercises, hip hinging, and squatting. Just a brief note on stability. Stability is often confused with core work. Stability is the ability to harness, deaccelerate, or stop force. I let you create force in the safest manner possible, connecting your body's muscle groups with much less risk of injury to your joints, your soft tissue, and especially your vulnerable spine. You want a demonstration of stability? Watch a toddler move. This is everything we lose when we start sitting six to eight hours a day. The goal in life is to be strong, fluid, flexible, agile as we move through this world. There's no one-size-fits-all approach here. It's all about identifying your weaknesses and making them stronger. We need strength when your muscles are shortening, called concentric movement, and lengthening, called eccentric movement. I wanted to mention eccentric strength because it's an area much overlooked in our training, and it grows increasingly important as we age. Most falls occur going downhill or stepping downward. Eccentric strength of the quads is what gives us the brakes required when we're moving downhill or down a flight of stairs. A 
majority of falls occur because of lack of eccentric strength. Practice slow step downs. Can you, st can you step off an 18 inch box in three or more seconds? Something to try at home. Almost everything we do in our daily life goes through our hands. Our feet are in contact with the ground, absorbing force. Our hands are how we transmit this force. It's all about how you distribute force. If you can tr transmit force and modulate force through your hands, then you can push and pull efficiently. This force originates in the trunk and is transmitted down the chain from the rotator cuff to the elbow to the forearm to the wrist. There is a strong correlation between having weak rotator cuff and grip strength. Because I don't do much to contribute to my grip strength in my day-to-day -day life, I have become a deliberate in training this as part of my everyday training. When is the last time you worked on your grip strength? The average American male in their 20s has a right-handed grip strength of 101 pounds. This is down from 100, 121 pounds in, in the 1980s. Grip strength is a proxy for muscle mass. Muscle mass is a proxy for testosterone. Men's testosterone levels are at an all-time low. Grip strength also indicates robustness and your ability to protect yourself if you slip. Exercise to consider for your grip strength or weighted carries such as farmer carries, dead hangs just hanging from a chin up bar, and plate pinches where you just hold on to a weight. There are many various hip hinge exercises. They should be a staple of everyone's routine. Learning how to hinge your hips and fire your glutes and hamstrings is critical to unloading your delicate spine. If you're new to exercise and don't feel comfortable with deadlifts, then step ups, step ups may be your ticket. The step up can be performed on a variety of size boxes from 12 to 20 inches. It's an excellent exercise for both concentric, the step up, and eccentric, the step down. Perform the step up in two seconds while stepping down in three seconds. Start with just your body weight and add weight or adjust the sides of the step as your ability dictates. Step ups are also a great way of working on a key component of your stability. And as you add dumbbell weights to the step ups, you're also working on your grip strength. Let me tell you about one of my favorite patients. I'll call him Sam. I met Sam in the stress lab <clears throat> a little over a year ago. Now, Sam is an attorney working 40 years, like many, trading wealth for health. Sam's stress didn't go so well, and he went on to get several stents by my partner, Dr. Elisa. It was re recommended that Sam go to cardiac rehab, and he tried but his back and his legs just didn't cooperate. I asked him, Sam uh, to try a different approach and realized that he was looking at pain meds and an unhappy retirement, he conceded. There are many out there, there are many of you out there that think that you're just too old or too far gone. I'm here to tell you that the lower your level of fitness, the more you have to gain. There are numerous studies showing improvements in functional capacity and muscle mass in people in their 70s and 80s. The true power of exercise is its ability to transform people to make them functionally younger. I want to repeat that one more time because I think this is probably the most important thing that I'm going to say today. The true power of exercise is its ability to transform people to make them functionally younger. Sam's goal was to move freely without pain and regain enough confidence to go to Arizona to meet, to visit his kids and his grandkids. The therapist started him off like he did me with some abdominal breathing, the segmental cat cow, and to lessen his risk of falling, balance exercises. He progressed into one leg walking exercises and dancing to help him relearn how to move his feet and react to visual cues. 
This progressed to walking lunges to strengthen his lower body. Next came his upper body with scat core stability exercises. On one of our, our follow-up visits, Sam got down and gave me five. The therapist then put him, then gave him drills designed to increase his ability to react and stay balanced. Last week, Sam sent me two pictures, one with him sitting cross-legged with his kids and grandkids in Arizona, and the next with him walking up a steep hill uh, with, his, with his son. Thank you, Sam. My doctor told me to stop having intimate dinner for four, unless there are three other people. Orson <laughs> <Or some> Welles. <laughs> when someone comes into my office, the subject of diet often comes up, but I cringe. There are over 40,000 diet books on Amazon, and each one of them has their own biases. There is no one diet out there for everyone. My job is to make recommendations based on the patient's goals, their body composition, and their lab values. Certain questions always need to be addressed. Are you overnourished or are you undernourished? Are you overmuscled or are you undermuscled? And lastly, are you metabolically fit? Meaning, what is your blood sugar? your insulin, your triglycerides, your HDL, your LDL, and your blood pressure. Unfortunately, I find many of my patients with heart disease that are overnourished, undermuscled, and metabolically unfit. In this case, a diet higher in protein with some sort of caloric restriction would help. Caloric restriction can be done in, in, in many different ways. Restricting their feeding window, finding a, a boogeyman in their diet, or, sip, or simply portion control. When I say finding a boogeyman in a diet, this is often very successful, and I'll give you one little example of an incident that happened, and this is a very true story. So, as you know, I have a passion for saunas, and usually every Saturday, Sunday afternoon, I'm at the YMCA in, in their sauna. Uh, gentleman comes in, comes in with a, a locker, and he doesn't know me from Adam. Um, he just got back uh, from his cardiologist, and he was on insulin, and he was morbidly obese. And we were talking, and um, we started talking about diet, um, and I identified that he was drinking a gallon of milk every day. And I said, sir, I said, if you give up that gallon of milk, you'll be off of insulin in about a month's time. I seen that gentleman about uh, three months later. He goes, you know what? You were wrong. I said, what do you mean? He goes, it only took me a week to get off of insulin. Oh, wow. Wow. Over, the course, over the course of the year, uh, I kept on running into him. He lost over 70 pounds just by giving up the milk and by giving up his nightly snacks. He was uh, off of he was completely off of insulin, and uh, no longer walking with a walker. Wow. So, what are the boogeyman's in your diet? What I believe we get wrong about diet. Protein should be something that we build our diets around. If we're talking about muscle, we need to talk about the building blocks of muscle. Protein needs to be looked at as an absolute number, and no matter what you call your diet, whether you're a vegetarian or, or carnivore or whatever, your diet needs to be built around protein. The dietary guidelines for protein are a joke. The dietary guidelines for protein states that, uh, that we should consume 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. This is how much protein we need to stay alive. It's not how much protein we need for ultimate health. And if we want to build muscle, our, our protein needs need to increase accordingly. Should, to find a diet that should align with your, with your goals and your blood work, we all react differently to foods. 
Some of us can eat saturated fat without raising our cholesterol. Some of us are intolerant to gluten. We need to avoid uh, gluten and wheat products. Diabetics and those that are insulin resistant have a disorder of carbohydrate intolerance. Getting your labs done once or twice a year and working with your PCP can, can, in, can, directly, can direct you into finding the proper diet. Remember, we have no requirements for carbohydrates in our diet. We do have for essential fatty acids and amino acids the building blocks of protein. Whether you are 16 or 80, we have to make 300 grams of protein per day. We have a cycle of protein synthesis and protein turnover. As we get older, the efficiency of protein turnover goes down. The good news is by optimizing the amino acid leucine, we can make a 60-year-old look like an 18-year-old. It takes 30 grams of good quality protein to produce 3 grams of leucine. Leucine is a trigger of inner, inner muscles called mTOR. It is a trigger for protein muscle synthesis. The most important meal of the day. Most of us, most of us sleep six to eight hours a night. If we had dinner between five and six and did not snack, and then we have our next meal of the day between seven and 11, that gives us a good 12 to 16 hour fast. At night, while we sleep, our organs continue to function. It uses amino acids driven from our, our muscles as fuel. So we wake up in a dehydrated state, a negative energy balance state, or what we call catabolic state. So what do most Americans reach for first thing in the morning? Our coffee or tea, a high carbohydrate meal such as bagels, toast, cereal, oatmeal, pancakes. We never, so we never rehydrate. So we're always in this dehydrated state. And so we're always walking around fatigued. And then we keep on losing muscle mass because we never replenish the amino acids that were taken from our body at night. So we need to rehydrate with water and replenish our muscles with good quality protein first thing in the morning. Breakfast should include about 40 grams of protein. Remember, 30 grams is generally required for three grams of leucine, which is required for protein muscle synthesis. Personally, as I told many, two, uh, many of you two years ago, I am training to be the healthiest 100 year old I can be. So what does this look like? It's going to look different for all of us. I define it as being able to get up in the morning and do what my heart desires. I want to go golfing. I want to work in my garden. I want to read a book. I want to be able to play pickleball. I want to make love. And I want to go dancing. I remember going for, my, I remember going for a walk with my dad, and he was in his 80s at this time. And he was telling me, I think people get old when they stop thinking about their future. If you want to find out someone's age, listen to them. Some guys just go on and on about passive achievements in their glory days. If they have no, and those people have nothing to live for. They've gotten old. If they tell you about their dreams in the future and what they're looking forward to, they're still young. Your lifespan and your health span are far more malleable than you think they are. It's up to you to plot a different path for your life. Here's to make each decade better than the one before. Thank you for your time. I have a question. Uh -oh. uh -oh. All right, when we're in here doing our classes, I'm using small weights just not to hurt other parts of my body. Uh -huh. But that's not really helping me get muscle mass, right? No. Should I increase my weights? Yes. To like what? I mean, I've used three and four and it seems to fatigue me, but yeah. you get used to it, I guess. Yeah, so, I mean, when you're doing these classes, they're, they're more of a repetitive type things. 
So you need to understand that that's fine. Those are fun, but it's not training, right? And so your, your, your muscles and your bones respond to adding more weights. So you, you should spend, you know, work, you know, if you're uncomfortable uh, working by yourself, find a trainer to show you how to do some of the movements that I was talking about, a push, a pull, a hip hinge, a squat. We do those in here. Minimal. Okay. <laughs> with, with a little bit more weight. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. How much weight do you need, though, to start creating muscle mass? 20, 30? Well, I mean, every, everybody's a little bit different, right? Yeah, I mean, what, what's good for me is not going to be good for you. Right. When I was doing the machines up there, I was like at 30. Uh -huh. But in here, it's doing something different. And I don't know, I just have to find the challenge to move my weight up. I mean, even little things like I talked about um, in the top, of just trying to do body weight step ups. Start off with that 12 inch box. Mm -hmm. you just try doing your body weight. And so when you step up, um, so when you step up on a two second count, and then when you step down from the box, try to do a, a three second count. And it'll be a little bit difficult, so just be closer to the wall. We do use a step thing, but you were saying 12 inches or mm -hmm. 18 inches? This is well, start with 12 inches. Four right? is out there. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. 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 But that's excellent. And then the other thing that you want to work on is you want to work on your grip strength. So um, you just pick up some dumbbells. I mean, um, ideally, a woman should be able to carry 75% of her body weight. Now, you don't have to start out that way. <laughs> but, but yeah, believe it or not, that, that's your goal. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Alberta. <clears throat> work with Berta. But I mean, just just maybe just grab a couple of twenties to start off with, yeah. and just oh. just try to walk around. And so it's almost like a plank. You're um, you just standing erect, and you're just going to walk back and forth with the weight. And there's a lot of you can you can go on YouTube, and there's plenty of dip, that's, they're called farmers carry. Or you can grab like two ten pound plates and pinch them like this mm -hmm. and walk around with that. But grip strength is is huge. In the fact, and you have to sort of think about these kind of things now. So if you go to fall, right, say you get up at, at night and you're walking to the bathroom and it's dark and you, you trip, you're going to reach out for something. And that's going to be your grip strength reaching out whether you fall or not. One other question. 120 over 80 used to be the average for blood pressure. It's so, not anymore. Didn't they change it? No. One, so our target is um, 120 to 130 systolic um, and then 70 to 80 um, the diastolic, the bottom of the curve. Well, instead of using that 12 inch box, because I don't <laughs> think I could climb it, <clears throat> how about just steps, going up and down your steps? Does that help? Yeah, but again, so if you're just but, um, so if you're just going up, so then you're just working on the concentric. You'd be surprised how weak you are. Um, just just step on a box and then just try to step down on a three second count. You'd be surprised. Like when I started working with a physical therapist at the time when I was having some, some problems I wanted to get evaluated, I was squatting up to 300 pounds. But then he had me step down from a bench and I felt like an idiot. I, I had no strength. I had no. I had no eccentric strength. But again, I mean, eccentric strength is very important as we age because most people are going to fall stepping off the cliff. I mean, how many people do you know that that fell or broke their hip when they stepped down from the curb? Yeah, Sister Maureen. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. She broke it bad. Yeah. I have one other question. Why am I getting Charlie horses in the middle of the night? <laughs> <laughs> not enough water. <clears throat> Is that it? Not enough water? I'm well, it could, it could be it could be a medication. It could be from one of your medications. I don't know your medical history. Um, it could be, or it could be a electrolyte imbalance. You can try something very simple to correct your electrolytes uh, by taking magnesium before you go to bed. Magnesium is one of my go-to supplements. I take magnesium every night before I go to bed because I, I find that magnesium helps me with my deep sleep. 
Oh, but I can also help mm -hmm. with I, cramps. I thought that was hard on your stomach to take before you go to bed. No. Does it bother you? Mm -hmm. You just there's different plain magnesium up. Yeah, so there's different forms of magnesium. Magnesium comes in many different forms. I, um, so um, to get more of a laxative effect, you take magnesium citrate or oxalate. I take magnesium glycinate. Um, magnesium glycinate is very easy on your stomach. Glucinate? Gl uh, glycinate. Uh, G-L-Y-C-I-N-A-T-E. I will try it. So, so what else would you 